Okay, I'd like to go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome you all to the NTEC uh, Talking Series Conference. Uh, we're going to be listening to What's Your Story? Presentations that make an impact. And briefly, I want to introduce Christine Gonzalez. She is a senior uh, project like, manager. Um, let me interrupt you for a second. If you come to these conferences, no one pays attention to these bios. I care because it makes me sound good, but I, I um, and I'll explain why I just interrupted Steve in just a moment. Um, so as I was putting this talk together, I was trying to figure out what's my way of giving you an interesting intro, a story you're going to relate to, something to draw you in. Do I start with tanks? I mean, that's my thing, but I know it's not your thing, probably. Uh, do I go into some scary stories? Um, talks I've given in the past where things have gone awry, there's been problems and lessons I've learned that I can share with you to make your lives and presentations even better. Or, oh, maybe I go back to sixth grade. First talk I ever gave, I had no cards, I'm nervous, I'm talking about Modest Mazorsky, a, um, a Russian composer from the 1800s, I think, and, and I know you all can relate, because either you remember the first talk you ever gave, or even now when you give talks, you get a little nervous. And then, as I was practicing this talk, I realized, oh wait, do you know what? This, this is the wrong title. It's not my story, it's not your story. If you're giving presentations, it's not about me, it's about your audience. Who are they? What do they care about? What's important to them? What will help them and what will inspire them? People come to presentations to learn. They want to learn from you. But what's important to them? That's how you should be crafting your, your presentation. For eons, we've always told stories. That's how you gather people together. That's how you share information and change minds. So delight your audience. Educate and entertain them. Don't irritate them. <laughs> and um, tell stories. Lots and lots of stories. That's how you engage your audience. That's how you can share, share commonality and gain their trust and change their minds. So an overview of what I'll cover today. We'll go through the psychological aspects. We're gonna dive into your mind, the speakers, and give you some, some insight there. We'll look at body language, the slides themselves, and also the room. So starting out with the psychological aspects, there's some assumptions I wanna debunk first. First, the number one fear is public speaking. How many of you guys have heard that before? Number one fear of people? Okay, it's false. <laughs> I suspect the people who put this out there are selling talks and conferences on how to become a better public speaker, because hey, scare people, and try to bring them in and get their money and try to teach them how to speak. It, the, the number one fear, it, it varies depending on the survey, but it's snakes, it's heights. For some people, it is public speaking, maybe 7%, and anymore, a lot of people put the number one fear is having enough money when you get older. <laughs> it's not public speaking. So that's not, it's not a reason not to be a good public speaker. Also introverts or poor speakers. You may have heard this or as an introvert feel like, oh, I'm shy, I'm nervous. I recommend this book called Quiet by Susan Cain. How many of you guys are familiar with it? Okay, highly recommend it. And what it touts is that introverts, well, I'm an introvert, I'll, I'll admit it, we think before we speak, and I believe that actually makes us a better public speaker. Another assumption, well, what lens do you see your audience through? When you're giving a presentation, is this what you see? Is that the crowd, is that what you think is up there in front of you, people who are gonna attack you? Or, um, so think of it, is the lens you're seeing that I'm a fake, uh, they're gonna laugh at me, they hate me, they don't care? Or is it possible to shift your lens, to see your audience in a different way? Perhaps, hey, look, they're excited to see me. They want me to succeed. They're interested. They want to learn. They believe in me. They like me. What if you could see your crowd through these rose-colored glasses? It'd make all the difference, because it's not so scary anymore. It's not you against them. It's this communal effort to give your talk and to share that information and to learn. It's a really cool way to see your audience. So psychologically, you may feel like, oh my god, I'm in the spotlight, oh, this sucks. Uh, here's some ways to downplay that spotlight a, a little bit. Well, first, I'm assuming you do want to speak. If you're absolutely terrified up here and just can't talk, there's places where you can get help, like Toastmasters, great groups so you can practice public speaking. Dale Carnegie has courses. You may need to 
delve into therapy. I mean, this is something where you may need to work really hard on yourselves to get past this. But keep in mind, public speaking, that's just one way of having your voice heard. The lessons you'll learn today, this is stuff you can use in the boardroom, stuff you can use in meetings with coworkers, stuff you use when you're with clients to better help your voice be heard. And that's really important. Or the last thing I suggest, suggest is team with a coworker. There may be people in your office who routinely present and they're really, really good. Say, hey, I want to get better. Could I present a, a part with you? Give me a graph to explain. Get a little taste of it so the whole burden is on your shoulders, but you're working with someone who's really good and can help you progress. Some other tips. Well, some people have the imposter syndrome, particularly women. They feel like a fraud. They feel like they're going to be found out feel like they don't know their stuff and, and someone's going to ask a question that they won't know. Um, also, women tend to underestimate our abilities. Just keep this in mind. In the, in the audience, how many people know your topic? How many, like, there may be one or two, and the rest, they want to learn. They want to hear from you. They want you to succeed. The best thing you can ever say if you get to questions at the end is, I don't know, but, uh, and I love it. I don't know, but, oh, John, you were at that conference last week. Remember when we were talking to that guy? What was his name again? Use your audience. It's a team effort giving a talk. Or I don't know, but, oh, you know what? Um, Julie, Julie's with me, and she'll be back at our booth after the talk. Come on back to our booth, and we can get you the answer there. Or I don't know, but I know someone in my office who does now. Do you want to give me your business card after this? I'd be happy to get you the answer. There are the ways you can easily get past what you don't know. Because you don't need to know everything. You just need to know where to get that information. And finally, practice. Practice, practice. When I started giving presentations on a regular basis, the night before my talk, I'd hole up in my, um, in my hotel room. I didn't go out with anyone. They're all out drinking, having a fun time. But I want to get my talk right. So I'm in my hotel room. I've got my laptop. I've got my clicker. I've got my my. my, my laser pointer, and I am going through my talk, item by item, three times, out loud, standing there, three times, that's an hour and a half. Plus, each time I do it, I realize, oh, that wording isn't quite right, or the sequencing, I don't like the way that's set up, let me shift that, let me change that. You can usually change your talks right up to you know, five minutes before the presentation. Make it better, make it better so it makes more sense to your audience. And here's a cool thing, back in those days, my office would just send me the presentation, and I thought it sucked. <laughs> there, was, there was photos that were 20 years old, it just didn't make sense, so I'd routinely change it, and I never told the office, you don't need their permission. Well, you don't. That's not true. <laughs> you don't always need their permission if you're making it better, if you're making it clearer. If you're following the uh, suggestions I have here, your audience is going to be delighted, and that's what you want. But practice, practice, practice. How many of you guys grew up with a Brady Bunch like me? Like, actually, I was watching, I think I saw six episodes yesterday. <laughs> so if you remember the scene where Marsh is getting her driver's permit, and, um, well, think about the first time you ever drove. You sit, in fact, you may have kids now that are starting to drive, and you're going through this again. And you realize when you sit down in the car, there's a lot going on in there. The steering wheel, the little things on the side, there's pedals. All these things to pay attention to, and you have never done this before. And then there's stuff outside the car. There's other cars. There's the, the line in the middle, the line on the side, and where do you put the car? And first time you drive, it's a little terrifying. The tenth time, eh, you get a sense of where your body goes. Hundredth time, you're probably ready for your driver's permit. Now, when you get in a car, do you even think about driving? No, you just you just sit there and drive. That's what. If you do this a lot, public speaking can become that way. But for me, I, I love it <laughs> because I'm at the point where I find little fun things to do like, oh look, I'm the storage tank queen, I have a crown, yay, isn't that cool? <laughs> Goofy little things like that to delight my audience. You can get to that point, it just takes a lot of practice. Second thing is body language. Here's some tips. Smile. When you smile, well, I'm approachable. I'm engaging the audience. Also gives me a break for a second. Calms the nerves a little bit. And speak to your audience. 
At Entech, a couple weeks ago, we had a state of the company um, address, and one of the principals, the whole time, he's up here and he's reading his slides. My concern is less for you know internal audience, it's what if he does this for the clients? What if he's not looking at them? Speak to your audience, it makes all the difference. But here's the thing, where do you look? Like I remember when I started, I was told, oh, don't look them in the face, look at the top of their head, top of their head, look at the back of the room. Try it. Try, if you're new to it, see what works for you, try different techniques. Some people think it's terrifying looking into the faces of their audiences. When you get more used to it, what you realize is it's a barometer. It's a gauge on are you reaching them? Um, sometimes they'll nod their heads as they're listening. You're like, oh yeah, they get it, they get it. They're with me. Once again, it's a group effort. If they start closing their eyes, if they're looking at their cell phones, then, then I realize, well, once again, it's not me, it's about them. I need to engage them better. I need to change the pitch of my voice. I need to change the slide. I need to move on from this topic because they are clearly bored and maybe they don't need this information. It's my job to keep things moving along and make sure they're interested and engaged. Um, just act natural. <laughs> and you may be saying, what the heck? There's a thousand people looking at me, what's natural? Think of it like you're at a, I don't know, a cocktail party. There's all these people around, but you're just talking to a few right here. And, and well, do you normally move around? Does anyone just stand silent or stand quietly? I can't because I have to move my body. But maybe, maybe like occasionally you'll shift over to the other side of the room. Um, the pacing back and forth because you're nervous. Well, keep in mind that's about you. Move it down a little bit because I know that makes me seasick when I see people get back and forth, back and forth. But a little moving around, now I'm probably meeting Steve more. And he, and he likes it, look, he's smiling. So try to see, once again, you can play with it. See what feels good to you. And then what about your hands? I remember when I started, I was like, I don't know what to do with my hands. I'll just keep them back here. Once again, that doesn't really feel natural. The more you do it, the more I realize, well, if I'm just hanging out with Steve, I constantly talk with my hands. <laughs> he's smiling and laughing because he knows it's true. This is just the way I, I have no Italian in my blood, but this is the way I talk, I talk in 3D. So do the same thing during your talk, not to an exaggerated level that is a distraction, you don't wanna annoy your audience. And fake it. <laughs> uh, if you grew up with Wonder Woman, you know she's very powerful, she was always my role model. Uh, I don't know if any of the guys wanted to be Wonder Woman, but I did. <laughs> fake it, fake it until you make it. When you're starting your presentation, here's some suggestions. Never say these things, you'll be undermining yourself. Never say, well, as Steve or Mary said, my name is Christine, I work with Entech Engineering. Here's the thing, Mary or Steve, they already said it. It was up on the first slide, and now I'm repeating myself. You're annoying the audience, they already heard all that. Let me tell you about Entech Engineering. Here's the thing, as an audience member, I didn't come here to get a sales pitch. Stop. I always get nervous in front of an audience. If someone says that, I start watching them very closely. <laughs> Are they shaking? Is their voice quivering? Where, how many times, like I'll count, how many times do they mess up? I'm distracted. Don't give them a reason to be distracted. I didn't have enough time to prepare. Well, what that tells me is you didn't make time to prepare. You don't love me, you don't care about your audience. Because if you did, you would have found time to prepare because we're all spending our valuable time and we want to hear and learn from you. Make time. Don't annoy your audience. During the talk, I have a bad cold. Well, then I'm just going to listen to how many times you snip. I'm distracted. I'm not sure this video is going to work or not. What that tells me is you didn't get here early to make sure your video is going to work. Um, uh, pro tip, I almost never use videos because you don't know if they're going to work or not. Just don't do it. It's not worth the like mental anguish of waiting until the end of the talk and seeing is it going to work or not. You probably can't read this. If any of you ever say that, I am throwing a marshmallow at you. I swear to God. I am tired of this. There is no reason you can't make the presentation visible. Use bigger font, and I'll show you more about that in a moment. I can't. That, what this tells me, you don't care about your audience again. You could have made the font bigger. Don't annoy your audience. <laughs> and finally, at the very end, um, don't end this way. That's all I got. I hope nobody has any questions. Thank you. Because <laughs> here's the thing. 
if you go to presentations, you know, this normal sequence is you do the summary, you ask if there's questions, they say thank you, a round of applause. If you do something that's off, it just makes the audience feel a little weird. So don't annoy your audience. For the slides, oh, this is cool. Um, there's a project I worked on years ago in York, Pennsylvania. It was a fire protection tank, 30 foot diameter, 30 foot high, welded steel with a flat bottom. And the owner got a leak. There's a leak where the bottom of the shell and tank met. And uh, I ended up helping them with the rehab. But we knew the bottom at the edge of the tank where the shell is, we knew the bottom was corroded there and needed to be repaired. But I wasn't sure about the bottom in other spots. Was it the whole bottom that needed to be replaced or not? So what we did was we cut out coupons, cut out sections of the bottom. So you all right now have a visual image in your head. You've listened to the story and you're thinking of one thing. What if I showed you this? We cut out coupons from the bottom. They're about six inch diameter and the steel, you can see what the condition is. It tells you another story. What if I have um, something giving you a scale? That's a pen there. Once again, you're learning a little more, more about these coupons. But what if I showed you the coupon? <laughs> the underside of the bottom, not corroded. And this is like a 40 year old tank. It's in really good shape, you can see. Bottom's only a quarter inch thick, pretty amazing. Steel is wonderful. Show, don't tell. It's very, very powerful. I feel how you just felt there. This makes a difference. Oh, and I'm not gonna pass this around to the audience right now. That distracts people. Do you want them to pay attention to you and be with you? We're looking at the coupon. They can come up afterwards if they'd like to see this. But these things, now Sherry uh, out in Pittsburgh, I was on a project with hers. Nothing better than you know peeling paint off a concrete tank in a treatment plant. I have all these treasures, I've saved them over time. It takes time to get them, but when you see them, grab them. You never know when you can use them. Because 87% of our communication is visual. So that means the hearing part, you're only taking in 13% of my message. The more photos I can show, the more words, and, and everyone learns differently. Some people learn by hearing more, some people see it, they need to touch it. The more ways you can hit people, the more likely they are to get your message. With photos, bigger is better. I'm gonna throw NTech under the bus right now because um, we have some standard slides available for everyone who wants to give presentations. And when I saw this, I thought, oh my God, if anyone uses this, well, here's the problem. The pictures, you can't see them. Like what, what, I can't, I can barely tell what's going on there. These captions underneath, caption one, caption two, it's 12 point font and in gray, you can't read that. Uh, even the project highlights over here, small font, the, um, the um, contrast between the dark uh, background and the light lettering, not so great. So what if you did this? What if you used the whole slide for that picture? Now we see, oh, I think our architectural department, they did help with a renovation uh, at, a, at, a, at a college. And oh, it's a subway, look, because look, there's subway, but I couldn't see that in the tiny, tiny little picture. So bigger is better when it comes to photos. If, if you want to add a few words and notes, you stick something at the bottom like that. It's not distracting from the photo. And this, when I blew it up, wasn't really good quality. So ideally use the original photos with very high quality so everything's very sharp and dynamic. Font size. Can you read this? 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 From the back, Lori. Um, which one is the best? Yeah. Yeah. It's just like in the doctor's office. Exactly, just like the doctor's office. You nailed it, just like the doctor's office. So which one can you read? Well, I can read all of them, actually, but the, I like the um, second to the last or the third to the last. OK, so 32 point. Almost no one uses this. I, I do, because I don't want to annoy my audience. But it does think something twofold. One. Everyone can read it, even the people at the very, very back who like are only half, halfway want to be there. Now they're engaged. They can see it. You're not bothering them. The second thing, it limits the words you put on there. You can't put a lot of words, and that's ideal. You don't want to be reading your slide and disconnecting from the audience. You want to be highlighting things with them. So 32 points ideal, 24 point minimum. Fonts have feeling. So you'll see different font types that are available. Just because it's available, don't use it. So I like, um, we often use Calibri and then Arial. 
is a very good one, also known as Helvetica, but you can't get that with uh, Windows-based uh, programs. Fonts have feelings, and these fonts actually are sort of um, very basic. There is no feeling involved with them, so that allows the message of the words to come forth. If you're doing a wedding invitation, oh my god, use script, use fancy stuff that are flowery and flowing and feel like love. <laughs> if, but don't use that in a presentation on water tanks. That'd just be silly. And you're like, the audience is like, why does she have that font? I feel weird. <laughs> it's not making sense. If you have something very impactful you want to say, something very dynamic, use the impact. Um, sometimes the names of the fonts sort of give you a sense of the feeling that's behind it. So if I was saying make a bold statement, I'd use impact. So typically use the very basic fonts like Arial and Calibri, and then uh, when you have a bold message, you can go with something else. Always use the same font. When someone has three, four, or five fonts on their slide, I'm like, oh, they just realized they can use different fonts. I wish they didn't, because <laughs> it's you're making it harder for them. They have to pay more attention and, and try to figure out what is, what is she saying. Don't use all caps. You all know this. When you send your emails, and when you send, and you're yelling at someone, don't do it in the slides, except perhaps with a heading. Left justify. The reason behind this. When we read English, we're reading from left to right constantly. So by left justifying everything, giving you a base, giving you a safe place, and giving you something you know to start with. And you shadow on words to make them pop. So watch the, the title of this slide right now, three slides. What I mean is, ooh, look at that. A little different. So they're sort of simple. They're making it pop. Sometimes the shadow can make it blurry. I use it to highlight things, and it's really powerful if you have words in front of a photo and you want them to stand out better. Five and five. Uh, this is a, a Christine, I need to come up with some words, some special word for this, but this is the guideline I follow. Five and five. Five lines, five words for each slide. You can have a few more, a few less. It's a good guideline because it allows white space to be there. It allows a pause for the audience, not too much to follow along with. And I'm going to break my rule right now with a six bullet, but do the bullets one by one. If you've noticed this whole talk, I've always gone through bullet by bullet by bullet. There's a reason, psychologically, there's so many reasons. When you're reading, you can read three times faster than I speak. Three times faster. So if I had all this come up at once and just start going through it, you'd be down at a shadow words to pop when I'm still talking about using the same font. <laughs> You want to be, it's like we're on a boat together and we're all traveling at the same pace. I want you to be going along with me, bullet by bullet, item by item, idea by idea. I don't want you to go ahead, be with the group, stay together. So bullets are a very powerful way of doing that. Visibility with the slides. Um, first, the contrast between background and the foreground. And you can see black and white there, probably the best one, maybe that one. That one does have some shadow behind it, but ideally uh, a light background with dark words, ideally black words. That's the books we're reading, that's the magazine articles, that's what our eyes are used to, and that's the most dynamic way of conveying words. When it comes to color, if you look at the yellow, that's just weird, you can barely read that. And down here, white, that's actually white. But think of something else. What if we look at a different contrast? We have a black background. Well, now actually some of the colors are more visible. White probably looks the best down there. But this is an ideal, it's a way of doing a slide or two, but I wouldn't recommend the whole slide presentation with a dark background and lighter coloring, because we're not used to it. Red, red means stop. It's good for stop signs, it's very poor for PowerPoint presentations. With the room, well, there's a lot you can control in the room. First, see the room before you go to give the presentation. So before I got started today, I came in here and I set up my props and um, some extra things over here, set up a camera over there, worked with Cheyenne to make sure the camera was all working and we're recording. I was here early and ran through basically, actually, we didn't have a clicker at first, we made sure the clicker was working. All those little things help me feel more comfortable and help provide a better presentation for all of you. Ideally, get there the day before. <laughs> it may be hard, but if you're there the day before, it can help calm your nerves. Practice in the room. When I started giving talks, 
I actually get through the day before and set myself up with a microphone, I'm speaking to an empty room, but I could hear my voice, hear what the mic sounded like, get a sense of space, where am I gonna be when I do that, what words am I stumbling over, what's working, what's not, it can really, really help calm the nerves. Use the mic, always use the mic. I don't have a mic today, so that was really bad, but I'll be giving this presentation at a women's networking conference on Thursday, and at that point I expect to have the mic and what I've realized is, uh, if you don't have a mic, you're essentially screaming at the front row, and the back row may or may not be able to hear you. It, it, it's a lot easier in the voice if you just get used to hearing your voice on the mic and, and use it. it. Makes it better for everyone in the room. And load and review the presentation beforehand. So I made sure when Cheyenne had the talk that I went through a few of the slides, it was all working, but nothing worse than, uh, particularly with um, Max, Max being transferred into a PC, everything's different. I used to do it all the time, and, and like the, just a lot of things lined up just never quite worked, so I'd have to go through it and make sure everything looked well and looked good for my presentation. You can also team up with your moderator. This is something I love doing, but it means you get there early. You introduce yourself, you make sure they know how to say your last name, which is Gonzalez. You, you work with them, they can really be they can be almost like a partner for you in the room. Uh, help with the lighting, uh, close the door if there's a lot of background noise during the talk. They can help with a five minute warning, but make sure you understand well, what's that mean? Does that mean I still have five minutes left of my 25 minutes of presentation and there's five minutes for questions or is there five minutes less left in my 30 minute talk? Just like, what's that mean and how are they gonna show you the five minute warning? It's teamwork. That also helps to keep the presenters on time. I'll never forget a conference I was at down in Maryland like five or six years ago. I'm the last presenter of the day, talking about tanks, so I'm excited, I practiced, I had my 30 minutes together. There was a guy before me speaking on fire hydrants. He was 2 to 2.30, and I was 2.30 to 3, and then that was the end of the conference. So the fire hydrant guy gets up, the moderator's there, introduces him, and the fire hydrant guy starts telling us jokes and riddles and showing mind teaser, mind bender things on the screen, one after another after another. And I'm thinking, what's he doing? What's he only have 15 minutes of content? 15 minutes, he's telling jokes and showing us mind teasers. Um, finally, to quarter after, he starts talking about fire hydrants. <laughs> that was weird. He talks about fire hydrants, we get to 2.30. He should be done, moderator should escort him off. He's still talking, 2.30, still talking, 2.35, 2.40. I'm getting so angry at this guy who's wasting, wasted our time, finally talking about hydrants, and the moderator's doing nothing. It was, and I had to shorten my talk to 20 minutes. Like, I didn't know what to do. Now, when I'm older and wiser. Here's what I would do now. If anyone ever starts off their talk by either selling stuff about their company, you know, as I said, you don't care about NTech as an audience member. You want to hear about presentations. If they start selling their company, if they start doing these funny jokes, give them a slide or two, and next time, I'm gonna say, with a smile on my face, because I'm really irritated, but I can fake it. Excuse me, sir, I'm really, really interested in hearing about the fire hydrants. Can you skip ahead to that part right now? Smile. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and here's the thing, the rest of the audience is thinking the same thing. They don't want to be sold to. They don't want to hear these stupid jokes. They want to hear about, they want to learn. That's why they're in the room. The second thing I wish I'd done, when we got to 2.30 and this guy's still talking, the moderator's just sitting back doing nothing. Excuse me, sir. I'm the next presenter and I, I really time my talk out. It's exactly 30 minutes. Can you take questions now and I'll get my presentation loaded so I can get started right away? Would anyone say no to that? I don't think so. But we have to advocate for ourselves sometimes. Ideally, the moderator is teaming with us, but sometimes yeah, you may have to help yourself. There's also speaker tools, things that I always have when I'm giving a talk. Actually, I'm gonna um, start with a couple things. There's some books I routinely use. Uh, this is the non-designers design and type books. When it comes to design and style, there's rules. Rules to make things look really good. And Steve knows this book. My first day here, I'm like, hey Steve, have you ever heard of this book? He's like, well, yes, I have. I'm like, I love it. <laughs> Oh, to get good, good slides, ones where photos are really important and you're minimizing the words, I highly recommend Gar Reynolds. He has several books out. This one is Presentation Zen. 
great book and sort of inspiration for ways to show and convey information and photos. But my sister, um, she's a speaker and just published her first book, Madness to Mindfulness. So I was out in the book tour with her last week, touring in Philly. I texted her yesterday. I'm like, hey, Jen, you, you talk all over, all over the world. What are your tools? What speaker tools do you always have with you? Because I've got my list. And I was like, what do you have? So I wanted to compare notes. She always has a laptop because you never know when they won't have one there. Sometimes, actually, the people organizing these conferences are not really good at communicating <laughs> who does what, who does the laptops. So I always have my laptop, always have the presentation, have the talk on a thumb drive. There we go. Have notes if I need any notes. Uh, water bottle, you can see she's got hers, I've got mine. It's water, not Starbucks. <laughs> um, a clock. This is something she had in all the talks she was giving over the past week. Uh, you can see it right there. It's not like you could use your cell phone and just tap on it and see what time it is and how you're doing. But what I realized was, oh, if there's a clock there, I can just glance. Like, that's so undistracting for the audience. I think I need a clock in my bag. Small one, but it could be very powerful. A pointer with a clicker. So actually, this is mine. I love it. Um, Ed had one at a wastewater conference a few years ago, and I used it. So it's got the clicker, it's got the pointer, oh, 12 bucks, 12 bucks on Amazon. My sister doesn't have one, so I just sent her the link so she can buy one. Love having your own pointer and clicker so you can use, you always have it available. Business cards, always have your business cards. It's always someone who wants a card and really loves what you had to say. And props, well, okay, you know, I've got my tank queen stuff. She has her mindfulness bell. So. In summary, top tips, it's all about your audience. Don't irritate them, educate and entertain. You can do both, and I hope you will do both. Show, don't tell, and use big pictures. Take up the whole screen so everyone can clearly see what your message. Use 24 point or larger font. This actually is 32 point. Feels very easy to read. And tell stories, lots of stories. That's how you're going to connect with your audience. So please check out our website, entecheng.com. We'll be putting this talk up there, along with pro tips, uh, things I've come to use, um, such as these books, and TED Talks, and other things like that that can be inspirational. Connect with me on LinkedIn, and here's my contact information. <laughs>